Write your goals like your life depends on them. But if you think you live in Disneyland and that goal's going to turn up, you're actually living in La La Land. You got to take massive action. You got to do WIT, whatever it takes. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. My guest on this episode is Tom Smith from a disadvantaged childhood in Belfast, you know, amidst the turmoil, the war-torn country uh, in Ireland. Uh, Tom overcame adversity. He built a thriving business and lost it all, built himself back up, betting on himself. He overcame addiction. He rebuilt himself even stronger. And now he leads several successful businesses, including luxury hotels, a line of beauty products, and a popular mindset coaching program. He most recently coached Molly McCann, the UFC fighter, in her big win uh, in Las Vegas. You're not going to want to miss this one. Check it out. Tom, welcome to the show. Mom, thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be on. I'm delighted to have you here. I mean, like, uh, look, you have an incredible story, overcoming war, torn conditions, addiction, losses, et cetera. I, I feel like you've gone through so much that most entrepreneurs or most people never even experience in their life. So I feel like we need to start there. Tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how it impacted your entrepreneurial journey. You know, I was, I'm just a kid from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, and we grew up, but you know, me and my brother and sister in a house full of love. Um, I'm really proud to say my mom and dad are still alive too. They're 70 years old, incredible people. And they've taught us amazing resilience and core values. But we grew up penniless, you know, we, you know, we grew up in Northern Ireland in the 1970s during a really violent civil war where bloodshed, bombs going off, buildings being blew up was just a normal day in our so-called paradise. Um, even the like of going to school and stuff, my mum and dad would have used the news as a sat nav for us because we would have looked at the news, not to listen to the media, but to find out who had been killed, where they had been killed, or where the bomb had been off. So then if we were going to go to school, we knew, not, we knew, we knew what way not to go. So we actually used the, new, the news as a tool. And growing up as a young man, penniless, and not having like the best sports gear and things like that, because we couldn't afford it, I decided at the age of 10 years old to get a job. And I worked in like what you guys would call a burger joint. Every day after school, I earned the equivalent of about $15 a week. But it was really good. You know, I realized money was poor and power was money. And sometimes it would have been me like buying a pair of sneakers and other times it would have been sometimes just simply looking at my own money box knowing I put that there. Me, Tom, 10 years old, I'm in this to win this. And, you know, going through a conflict, sometimes you can be a little bit discarded of things that really matter, like qualifications and stuff. So I left school at 16 without a qualification to my name. And I worked in a building site in Belfast. Now, a building site in Belfast is probably quite different than anywhere else in the world because at the time, you had two different religions working on a building site who absolutely hated each other. And the foreman that ran the site was a different religion than me. And the man hated my guts. So what did I do? I became the warrior on the building site and I moved breeze blocks, planks, cement, mortar and all the guys on the site loved the, the young laborer who was a complete machine and i even broke down the, the barriers of hatred because it wasn't this guy's fault he didn't have the toolbox to understand that there's more beyond hate but a year of working my ass off on that site i ended up earning this guy's admiration and we became friends so even during a conflict there's hope you know, we would say here, it used to be called hands across the barricades because that's what it was like, two, two you know, foes in a full-on war. So that was it, I suppose. You know, the war went on, it kept raging, but I became very lucky. At the age of 18, the 18-year-old version of me knew that alcohol didn't work for him. So when I went to the pub with the guys, they were all drinking lots of beer and vodka and all laughing. 
But I was looking at brochures to buy houses. Hmm. And the guys are like, you know, there's something wrong with you. And I'm like, is there? So I bought my first house at 19. And it was the, the biggest blessing I've ever done. Because what happened was both of our communities came together and called peace in 1994. And the peace process happened. Now, was I the right, was I in the right place at the right time? Or did I have the right mindset? So the house that I bought for 35,000 tripled in price within 12 months because Northern Ireland hit the proper world stage of normal house prices, house prices, business started booming and our new life was born. And it was hallelujah time. It was absolutely incredible. And that was the start of me as a young entrepreneur. I then became a contractor, worked through my early, my late twenties and stuff, done very well in Ireland, fell out with my first wife, unfortunately. And then I moved to Dubai um, and I did really well in Dubai. We were buying plots of land, selling plots of land. Now, when I say Dubai, I don't mean the Instagram Dubai that everybody sees. Mm -hmm. I mean the Burj Al Arab, the Jumeirah Beach Hotel, nothing else but desert, seven hotels in the marina and the Sheikh Side Road. That was it. But like we were there when there was nothing there, but we done really, really well. So after three years of that, I came back because my daughter was at home, Farah, who is my world, as is my other daughter. And I just thought, you know, I need to come back. But when I come back to Ireland in the UK, nobody knew who I was anymore because people forget. So when I lived in Dubai, I lived in an apart hotel called the Grosvenor House, probably one of the nicest hotels still in Dubai in the marina. And half the hotel was obviously a hotel. The other half was a, a, an apart hotel where you could have a home from home living. So I come home with this business model and said to myself, I'm going to do this in the UK and Ireland. So I met a new woman called Dolores and she became my world. And I completely fell in love. And how I fell in love with Dolores, it's quite a good story. I had took my two-year-old daughter to Euro Disney and I'd met this girl in an airport and she was going to Euro Disney. And I know it might sound corny, but I called my best friend and said, lad, I think I fell in love with some girl in the airport. And he went, listen, you complete weirdo. And I'm like, no, there's something there. And I remember putting my little girl on the plane and C27, because it's my birthday, 27, and said, Farah, that'll be back in two minutes. And I walked the whole way down that plane and it was like American Idol. I said, look, there's something happening here. I've never felt like this. Can I please take you out for lunch? You know, the two kids and she says, like, you are really freaking me out. And But everybody in the plane was listening and laughing. And she says to Rihanna, which is my daughter now, Rihanna, what do you want to do? And Rihanna says, mommy, I really like playing with Farah. And so she says to me, you've got a yes. And the whole plane started clapping and all this. <laughs> so, it's, like a, it's like a movie. Yeah. So I walked back up the plane. we are married each day for four days in Disneyland. And then in my wedding speech, I said, thank God for Mickey Mouse. Because Euro Disneyland brought us together, you know, so it, it was quite epic. But so I'd come back from Dubai, I'd met Dolores, but then I walked the streets of the UK and Ireland to find this business deal. And this is where the resilience of Northern Ireland and Belfast comes in. Because I walked the streets for a year and all I was told was no, no. Doors closed in my face, a thousand emails, 10,000 phone calls, and it was no. But see, when you've got a burning desire in your heart that's to succeed and you know you're going to get your yes, giving up's never an option, ever. And I remember Savills International Estate Agents called me in Belfast and said, Marathon, the hedge fund from New York, are coming to Belfast to buy the, the Opal Tower building. There was a gorgeous building in Belfast with 200 odd apartments. And everybody had defaulted on it during, during the, the recession in 2008. So this gorgeous high tower of 27 floors was sitting empty. Marathon came over and bought the tower. I'd done the deal with Savills. They called me and said, you won't believe this. And I'm like, please tell me. And they said, Marathon said no. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And they said, they, they've said no to you five year, but yes to you three. And I'm like, oh my goodness, get in. So 
The next thing, my company, Dream Apartments, was born. From a year of taking no, I got my first yes. So I knew my business model worked. Boots on the ground, walk the streets, get everybody to know you. And I'm now at a point now where I'm dominating LinkedIn. I'm only on Instagram eight months. I've got a big presence on it. And I'm in it to win it 24-7. And that's just one part of my company. You know, and I, I love life. I'm obsessed with success. My wife and kids are my life. And that's just a bit of an intro on me. I love it. And, and you know, one thing that that is clear about you, there's a lot of people who preach positive thinking and a lot of people who talk, you know, be positive. I think, you know, we, we kind of just met, but I, I could hear your story and I could hear the way you talk about things. I know you actually live it. But one I thing I, one thing I want to talk about is that words like positive thinking, mindset, manifestation, they're buzzwords right now that get thrown around a lot. And, you know, I'm a big believer in my success that I never wanted to talk about mindset when I was first starting, right? No, just show me how to, how to make money. Show me how to do that. Now I realize the game is mostly mental, right? So my mindset's super important, but I think it's become almost like a substitute for a lot of people of doing the work, like manifesting a million dollars won't bring you a million dollars unless you take action, right? So, exactly. so, but exactly. there's a lot of people talking about these buzzwords and manifestation. How do you reconcile that? It's, for me, it's the ultimate question because in my goals, and when I am teaching people as a mentor and dream mentor, I say to people, write your goals like your life depends on them. But if you think you live in Disneyland and that goal's going to turn up, you're actually living in La La Land. You got to take massive action. You got to do WIT, whatever it takes. If you have to walk the streets, send the emails, ask the guy out, ask the girl, whatever it is, get off your ass and make your goals happen. Yeah, but you know, I would really like to manifest this. <laughs> what planet are you on? You know, that's for weak people that want goals to turn up. The action takers are the winners because winners do truly win. Writing something and hoping it turns up is the mind of a fool. You got to take massive action every time, never stops, it always wins. And it just, it works. And see, when you know you've got a system that you can apply, it's, you actually can have fun with it, but you always need to work every single time. You know, it's, it's something that I, I don't think people really pay attention to, right? Because they'll either try to take massive action without any goal or strategy, or and they'll have a goal and, or they'll have a goal and strategy without any action. Yeah. Right. Sure, right? You, you kind of, it's a, it's a kind of like a must have recipe. You need both. Otherwise this cocktail doesn't work. Yeah. I, on my, you know, on my mom's life and I wouldn't callously say that I wrote a goal this morning and I was going up the escalators in an apartment store and to be on the podcast. What, what? The goal was to yeah, be on this podcast. Look, see your work. Of course. Manifestation. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. Well, it was to buy a large development site in Belfast. And I agreed it about two hours ago. Now, I knew it was hanging in the, in the, in, in the, the shadows, but I just made, took massive action this morning. I emailed, I pushed the guy, went for the price. I'm all in. And I've done it. You know, it, but it's that action taken is the guy that gets it over, or the girl that gets it over the line. But then there's also comfort, right? You reach a certain point in your life where, or a certain point in your business where you almost become comfortable. So I don't need more. I don't want, I don't need, I'm comfortable where I am. And I'm a big believer that there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing as, as, as sitting still. It's like being in the ocean. If you think you're sitting still, you're either flowing backwards or you're moving or, or, or you're moving forwards. How do you, you know, deal with that? Because I think that's also one of the other things that hold people back is they're like, no, I don't need coaching. No, I don't need this. No, I don't need that. I'm good where I'm at. And it's only like, are you? And for how long? Yeah, well, definitely a couple of answers are. I think, you know, it's not about never having enough. It's about, it's money's an amazing byproduct that comes with a buzz of success. You know, you know what I also love doing with money? Giving it away, hmm. the charity, the, as a present, as a gift. And see the fool who thinks he knows it all. He's the, he's the idiot that's sitting in the room. Like, I, I get mentored every Friday morning at 5.30 a.m., by the same guy for the last 10 years. 
it's never going to change because I'm never going to know it all. And the biggest idiot in the planet is the one who thinks he knows it all. And I had a business partner like that. And he would have argued with a brain surgeon on the on the procedure. <laughs> and the guy was just an absolute, he was a fucking idiot. So I want to talk something that you went a little bit out of, out of uh, it's a weird coaching thing that, that you've done. Molly McCann, right? You recently coached her. She had a big win in Vegas. What? So for, first off, what exactly were you coaching her on? What, what were you brought in on? a great question so you know what happened with me was i i used to be heavily involved in mma um myself and three business partners owned a company called cage wars we were on 300 million tv sets across the us um i became amazing friends with rich clemente from ufc um so my connection to mma was like stacking to none um i've been watching molly i seen that you had a defeat i know the power that i've got to help somebody with their mind and I actually reached out to her and said, Molly, my name's Tom Smith. She was coming back from a fight. I put her up in a hotel in Liverpool that I owned as, as a gift, just to let her say, you know, you know, that's okay, you lost, but please have a couple of nights on me. A person that she was very good friends with was a good friend of mine too. And the connection just came. Definitely everything was in alignment with the universe. She says to me, you know, what do you want of me? And I went, absolutely nothing. Um, I started sponsoring her from a financial point of view because I actually wanted to help her out because I know what it's like as a fighter. You know, it's not all about all these huge wins of money. That's coming now for Molly. I simply wanted to be associated with her. And then I completely fell in love with her like she was my daughter. We are super close, mega close friends. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to call her, call her like my close, one of my closest friends, but I'm also her mindset coach. So what did I do? I started to get the walk in the shoes of the elite athlete that I know she was. And then the next thing she started to believe and remember the person that she was. She's always been the amazing fighter, but after a loss, sometimes we can all lose ourselves. So the next thing she started walking through the streets of Liverpool and the elite athlete that was going to get a UFC fight and win again. And then it was just completely getting back into the amazing athlete was there. All we needed to do was strengthen the mind again. So the next time she went for that fight, not only was she on point for fitness that nobody could touch, but she had already won the fight in her head. And just coming up to Vegas, just in Vegas, I was phoned her on the Wednesday night. She says, what are you doing? She says, I'm about to get into the shower. And I said, put it on speaker. And I said, I want you to do the TV interview now in that shower explaining exactly how you have won that fight on Saturday night. And she done the TV interview and explained how she won that fight. Because in her head, all she was going to do was turn up. And did she win? She won fight of the night. She won fight of the month. And she was the most incredible elite athlete I've seen in a long time. I love her with all my heart. And I'm so proud to call her my friend. And I'm so proud to be her coach. What similarities do you, I, do you see in coaching like a, uh, I guess, an MMA fighter and an entrepreneur? Life's a fight. It's all the same. You know, sometimes life throws the kitchen sink at you. The fight that you fight as an entrepreneur isn't physical. But unless you're willing to get up when you get knocked down, you're going to end up getting defeated. You know, I was, tell, I, was doing, I was doing a talk last night and I was telling people, sometimes I go through six months of heaven and then I wake up under my quilt Lamb beside my beautiful wife, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so scared. Dread kicks in, anxiety. But when you know and you've been mentored and you've taught yourself, you know to yourself, positivity and happiness and dread and negativity live in two different frequencies. So what do I do? I write my goals, my gratitude, my mantra. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes I'll do high-level cardio. Sometimes it doesn't work. And like I told the crowd last night, Sometimes I'll play the pussycat dolls and the next thing, boom. <laughs> and, don't, and you're like, there's that tune. It's about finding the vibration because having a bad day and living in an anxiety world is a choice. And I don't choose to live in that world. And I'm lucky that I know I've got a universal toolbox and I just need to find, find the right one to get me on that wavelength where I win. So sometimes when I walk into the office at eight o'clock, the staff don't know I've maybe had a three-hour battle before I even turned up for work. 
but I'm lucky to have the tools to beat it. I, I guess well, I'm curious if, if you agree with this. I, listening to you talk, I think one of the similarities also versus, you know, coaching a basketball player or, or something like that is that being an entrepreneur is a lonely journey at times, right? Exactly. It's, not, it's not a team sport. It's on you. It's on your yeah. shoulders. Um, no matter how amazing of a, of a partner you have, how amazing of a wife or uh, if you're a female listener or, how, or whatever, no matter how, how much you have a support system in place, no one really lives inside your brain and understands how low those lows could be. And when you go to work, it's on you. The noise has to shut off. I imagine it's the same thing for a UFC fighter, right? In their mind, they're trained, they're training. No one knows what they're going through. No one, no one can take the punch in the face for them and be like, okay, I'm going to grab this punch for you. And, and then how to react to that when you're in the ring alone and all the noises have to get turned out. It, it's a very lonely journey for them too. And see those early morning sprints when nobody's watching you and, you're, and you've got that big fat word in your head, head accountability. You have to be that person to turn up. But it's also the same as the entrepreneur. Molly puts that work in when nobody's watching. And when she goes into that ring, she knows she's give a billion percent and that's why she wins. But it's the same for me and you as an entrepreneur. If we're not being accountable with ourselves, because if anything goes wrong in our companies, the only person who's felt it is, is ours because we haven't been accountable enough. You know, people say, you know, I've got a problem with that guy micromanaging me. Well, you're not obviously not doing your job if you've got a problem with each other. You know, Grant Cardone agrees, you know, but I'm just all in all the time. I'm accountable all the time. I like making the right decisions, but it's also because I've made 50,000 mistakes that I'm, I'm at a position right now to make the right ones. You know, I made a really bad mistake in Dubai and lost £200,000. Or did I have the best due diligence training course of my life? Because I'll never make a mistake ever again in my life. So, I mean, so you're, you're talking about mistakes and now you coach a lot, right? You, you, do, you do a lot of coaching. What is some of the most common mistakes or, or are there even the same mistakes that you find most people make? I think a big mistake people can make is choo choosing the wrong mentor and picking somebody who's never opened and closed a business in their life and somebody who's read something out of a book and doesn't have any scars to be able to coach you. You know, taking opinions of fools is definitely a massive mistake. Not doing your due diligence. The big thing for me that was one of my mistakes, I got so excited on my brand new life that I was going to have in Dubai, I took my eye completely off the ball. So if you're going to do due diligence, do it three or four times, rip it apart, put it back together again, check it again. And when you know you're right, you're right. I also, I also think, uh, I'm wondering if you see this too, because you're, you're just around um, way more people on, 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 a, on a bigger level. I'm, I'm wondering if you see this too. In the, in the people that I speak to, in the business owner I speak, I think one of the most common mistakes is that they get in their own way. And, and, and they overlook simplicity, right? And just how sometimes the answer is so obvious and simple, but as entrepreneurs, we come in and try to make things so complex. And maybe that's human nature. We try to make things so much more complex than it has to be. And then we end up stepping all over ourselves or getting in our own way. Do you see that a lot too? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people don't strive enough for success because they get complicated and how to do it, you know, it's a black and white world. You know, if you want to do it, you can 100% do it. Uh, the to-do bit is just something sometimes your amazing team can get involved in. But if you put the energy in, it's going to happen. But then that bit where it gets complicated is usually called self-doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't get caught up in that world. I treat my brain like a pinball machine. And if doubt comes in, it's just flicked out because it's not allowed in. If it's not paying rent. So how, so how, do, you, so how do you do that? Because I think that's an important thing. I think everyone, everyone listening... Uh, has had experience with self doubt. I know I've I've had experience with self doubt. So how how do you get over that? How do you how do you just be like a pinball and 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 knock it away? I think I'm I'm very lucky to have the skills, and you know I also treat my brain like an apartment. If self doubt isn't paying rent, you're not welcome in my head. Hmm. You know I'm also um, a recovering alcoholic, and I know what I know what this self talks like too. If my self talks wrong, Tom. I've got a great idea. Let's get a bottle of Grey Goose. No, get out of my head right now. I know who you are. 
I know the shit you've caused in the past. You're not welcome in my brain. Leave. And it's quite similar to self-doubt. So I'm on that guy. Because if the wolf comes out, it's not going to be fun. I'll make Charlie Sheen look like a, play, like a little choir boy. And that's not for me. It's not something to be proud of. I never want to be that guy again. I don't let that. So that wolf can stay inside my head. And self-doubt can leave. It's just, it's completely gone. I'm not having it. I don't overthink stuff. I just make decisions. And I make healthy decisions now. And you got a formula for it. So let's talk about that. What's the dream formula? So dream, the dream formula comes from my book, Fearless. It's an antidote to self-doubt. I started writing it during the global pandemic on my birthday. And when I say the dream process, D is for determination. And to say that I'm determined is an understatement. I am prepared to do whatever it takes to achieve my goals, whatever it is. I see myself as the definition of a juggernaut, an unstoppable force, because I'm all in. R is for regeneration, because we should all keep evolving every single day, keep turning into the best version of ourselves. And like you said, not stopping in the water, because you're either going to float or drown. E is for energization. And I'd like to think my energy will fill a room. You know, with Molly, the two of us ran half of Mount Everest during COVID, three hours, 40 minutes on stairs for children's cancer. So to say I've got energy, like I'm, I'm bouncing all the time. I'm, if I'm not feeling it, I drink triple espresso. So it's like an explosion going on. <laughs> um, ambition, I'm a kid from Belfast that had absolutely nothing. And I'm now living the life of my wildest dreams. I take nothing for granted. And I just, I'm just so grateful as a person. Motivation. Like, I am motivated 24-7. You know, I'm just, it might be hard to be around sometimes. Check that guy's energy out. But it's just me. And I love it. And, you know, I also can feed toxic people by, you know, around me when, when I'm so motiv motivated. So just don't let them into my life. But that's my core principles. That's how I wrote my book. And everybody who's read it's loved it. So, so let's talk about the book a little bit more. What made you decide to write it? I, like, I understand, you know, you wrote it during COVID. Um, it was a, it was a time for a lot of businesses. There was a lot of ambiguity, a lot of doubt, but I mean, like, do you bring the lessons that you've had, right? Like, cause, cause you actually know troubled times, right? This, this must be a cake in the, uh, like, you know, like this is a cakewalk, right. For, for, for what, what you've kind of gone through, but for a lot of businesses here, they don't, they never experienced what you've experienced. And this was their turmoil. And this was, a need to pivot or, or the end of, of a lot of different businesses. Uh, what was your motivation behind, behind writing it? I, I knew right in the book for me, I wanted to do something that was going to be remembered. I didn't know, I didn't know it was going to work, but for me, I knew it was going to be the most difficult trading pattern from the second world war. So I just thought to myself, I'm going to make something happen here. My own company lost, two million pound within five days because as a hotel business hmm. the, re the reservations just stopped so in between us still being allowed to open because we were very lucky because we were in a part hotel business not only did we start surviving we started thriving but i started booking time into my week every week and i started putting pen to paper and then by the following december i finished the book i added it on the january self-published it and it's became like a massive success. And I mean, is it, would you say it's the blueprint for overcoming self-doubt? For overcoming yeah, self-doubt, I should say? The answers are in there. They're very heavy hitting. You know, it's, it's about being straight talking. I would say my book is the straight version of the secret. It says <laughs> it how it is instead of rainbows and butterflies. It just is what it is. Um, and every single person who's read it, you know, I've even been really lucky to become good friends with Sean Ringle, the actor from America, because Sean bought my book and then we became very good friends. And when I was in America last week, I had dinner with Sean and met his little girls, met his wife, went to, this, went to his dad's house. And all of that came from that book. So I feel truly privileged that I've made amazing friends out of it. So one of the things I got to ask you is, is the Cardone license, 
right? Why go that route? Why become a 10 X coach? Why, like, like you've have the stories, you have the skill set, you have everything you need to, to do it. Why take that approach? I think it's the complete and utter respect that I have for them on, you know, my wife said to me about three years ago, you're still struggling with content. And I went, yeah, she says, you need to get on the ground Cardone. And I went, okay. And I was washing my car. I put on 10 acts on audio. And then I went, wow, there's somebody else like me. Since then I've realized there's an army of me. The guy would be what I would call my mentor. He's the man that I look up to, you know, similar backgrounds from addictions and stuff and things like that. But he's the ultimate businessman, all about cash flow, always about helping people, loves his family the way I love mine. Um, I feel magnetized to it. I was very lucky to be in Grant's office last week and had them, I don't know if you've seen it, the welcome that I got in 10 Axe headquarters was incredible. I met his man, Jared, Natalie, Elliot, and unfortunately, Grant was in Vegas. Um, I have the utmost respect for him. I believe 10 Axe is a way of life. And like, I am 10X. I didn't realize it existed until I read the content. I've read 10X 13, well, I've listened to it 13 times. I've done Obsessed or Be Average. If you're not first, you're last. I've read every single one of his books, including the Lena's too. And I just feel that massive connection with America and a huge respect for Grant, his wife and his kids and all his team. So what's next for you? What, 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 what do you have left on your plate that you still want to accomplish, still want to do? I'm that, you know, from the moves that I made a couple of hours ago, one of the big things I'm going to be is a master developer. You know, I want to build four or 500 homes a year. Up until now, I've been building about 50. I'm going to, I'm going to 10X that and do four or 500 a year across the UK and Ireland. The mentorship for me has exploded. One-to-ones, group mentoring, I flew to Beverly Hills over a week ago and I, sh I was able to shoot my online mentoring course in the Beverly Hills Hotel. Um, public speaking is going to be a big thing for me because I believe I've got a message to give people. You know, and I mightn't be like the cleanest guy in the world, but I believe I'm a vassal that, I, of, that God can use me for my stories of war, scar, addictions to help somebody else who's struggling. Um, I just feel blessed with my life. You know, my wife, Dolores, is a 20 out of 10. My kids, Far and Rihanna, are my world, my mom and dad, my staff. You know, I just, I'm a real grateful guy. And I might be full on, but I'm very humble as a person. Well, we'll end with this question because I think it's an important one. If there's an entrepreneur listening right now who feels stuck, who just feels like, you know, like, yeah, we all have that rut, right? We all, we all get stuck in the moment. What's your best advice to overcome that? The only person holding you back is you. Take a look in the mirror and be the amazing guy or the amazing woman that you know you can be. Tell self-doubt to get out of your brain. Believe in yourself again. Go and write a page of a mantra and write the most incredible thing about yourself. Start walking, off the sh walking in the shoes of the person that you want to become. And very soon you'll become that person. Tell self-doubt to disappear. I was going to say a bad word, but I won't. And take control back of your life. Love it. Tom, for the listeners who want to get in touch with you, they want to learn more about you, how can they find you? Thank you for asking. So I'm Tom Smith and it's S-M-Y-T-H. Tom Smith, the entrepreneur on Instagram. I'm Tom Smith on LinkedIn. And I'm on all other platforms, including TikTok. And thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, you, you have an incredible, incredible story, an incredible gift. And I hope you impact a lot more people through this podcast. Uh, that's my goal. That's my goal for you. And I think everyone should go, uh, go follow Tom, go show him some love. And, um, and yeah, and if you do so, send me a screenshot and I'll pick one of you and, uh, and we'll pick a few of you and we'll send you his book. So, uh, so let's do that for them. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you want, check out our most recent video over here. And this one is the one YouTube thinks you'll like. But if you really enjoyed watching, please do me a favor, like and subscribe over here. Thank you so much.